How many did you find? Netflix's latest hit manages to stand out from the crowded true crime genre as one of the most unsettling and disturbing shows of the year. The subject matter is sick and twisted, but few shows are able to make you, the audience, feel like you're experiencing that horror firsthand. And if you've seen the show, I'd be willing to bet that, like myself, after episode one, you needed a few minutes to catch your breath. Because no matter what you think of the series as a whole, there's no denying, episode one is a masterclass in creating tension. So today, I want to talk about the Jeffrey Dahmer story and how to create tension. We're going to be talking a lot about the scenes with Tracy in Jeff's apartment, but first we need to talk about how the show sets the tone. The first thing we do as an audience is hear, is hear. We hear a news broadcast highlighting the racial injustice in America, which is apt for the events that will unfold in this show. We hear car engines whirl from the busy street outside. We hear muted thuds and bangs and grinding from what sounds like a saw. We hear what Glenda Cleveland hears. It's worth noting too that all the sound is diegetic, which means it comes from within the show's world. With no music, no sound effects, the show instantly becomes grounded and real. If you close your eyes, you could be sat right next to Glenda on that sofa. The camera here is steady, but not completely still. As Glenda's concern grows, it slowly looms towards the source of the sound. The whirring, now accompanied by cracks and crunches, grows in volume as the vent comes into frame. That's where the sound is coming from. That's where all of this is happening. The sound becomes clearer and clearer, when suddenly we smash cut right to the source. A saw, covered in blood. We're now on the other side of the vent, but before we're introduced to this monster, We're introduced to where he lives. It's dark and messy, scattered around power tools and bottles of acid. The lighting resembles an abandoned subway station, washed in a dirty, grungy green. Compared to Glenda's house, the difference is clear. We see his door is prone to getting jammed and it's difficult to open. That will be important later. We're three minutes into this show and we finally get our first dialogue as Glenda confronts Jeff about the smell. Oh, hey. I gotta say, that smell is worse than ever. Notice how we stay fairly distant, only using long and medium long shots, until finally, four minutes in, Jeff approaches Glenda, walking into a close-up, the reverse shot tightening in as he does, suffocating her within the frame, creating discomfort. It's here that we get our first non-digetic sound as the eerie main theme plays. We've only had five minutes of this show, and immediately the tone is set. The sound design, the editing, the cinematography, the direction, the performance, all come together to ground us in this world. And all we know as an audience, just like Glenda, is something bad is happening. Okay, really quick, we need to talk about context. It goes without saying, the Dharma case is infamous, and people watching will know this is a show about a murderer. But not everyone will know the actual story of what happened, or the details. I, for example, had very little knowledge about what he actually did before watching this show. This is important because when watching these scenes, and specifically this first episode with Tracy, a large chunk of audiences will not know the outcome. We could be watching his first murder, We could be watching his last, but many won't know. Jeff goes to a nightclub where he meets Tracy, and he convinces him to go over to his apartment. The entire time our shots have either been smooth and steady, or locked off completely, but that will change in a moment. Once more, the diegetic sound grounds us as we hear cars go by in the street outside. Oh. Oh, what is that smell? Tracy begins to become suspicious as Jeff tells his bad meat story, which we can guess by this point is pure fiction. We can see this from Sean J. Brown's performance, but also we get these brilliant point of view shots seeing what Tracy sees. We return once more to the jammed door which Jeff wrestles to get closed, before finally turning the lock. And at this point, everything changes. 
Notice how different these two shots are. On the left, when Tracy enters the apartment, the depth of field is large enough to have his surroundings in focus. But once the lock turns and we return to a worried Tracy, the depth of field becomes razor thin. Here, we can only make out Tracy. His surroundings, including Jeff, are reduced to a blur. Suddenly, the apartment goes from more spacious and open to confined and claustrophobic. So tight, it's almost hard to breathe. Oh, what is that smell? Can I open a window? I need some fresh air. And it stinks in here. We, alongside Tracy, are now trapped. But that's not the only change. I mentioned the steady, locked-off shots before, but look now at how the camera behaves. It's subtle to begin with, but we've switched to a handheld, shaky camera. And this will only intensify as the tension increases. We're no longer watching safely on our sofa. We start to feel like we're standing directly in that apartment. The immersion increasing as our unease builds. The tension steadily begins its ascent. I think I'm a girl. No. Immediately, you will notice some of the shots in Jeff's apartment linger. And I mean linger. Are you so nervous? I spoke at length in my Boiling Point video about the effect long takes can have on tension, and the same applies here. It's as if each moment goes on and on, longer than it has any business lasting. During the nightclub scene before, shots would last an average of 8 to 10 seconds. Here though, some shots last 20 or 40 seconds or even over a minute. You can physically feel the difference. Tracy, and by extension us, the audience, want to get the hell out of that apartment. But the editor keeps us trapped inside each shot for as long as possible, which keeps us trapped inside Jeff's apartment for as long as possible. It makes it feel like you can't escape. Not all of the shots are long, however. Here's the entire 19 minute sequence inside Jeff's apartment. Notice anything? If I change the colour of every shot under 5 seconds, look what happens. Hmm we start to see these clusters, so let's take a closer look at them. Here, after a long and slow 30 second shot looking through the fish tank, Jeff handcuffs Tracy, who then tries to resist. A fight breaks out, resulting in Tracy being tackled to the ground. You're gonna make me do things I don't wanna do. Jeff grabs a knife. The realization of what's happening sets in. Do what I say. And then, almost as if we're trying to not make any sudden movements that might cause trouble, the shots slow down again. Here, he quickly tries to make a run for it before being stopped. I'm doing it! Stop trying to leave! Okay. Okay. Quick cuts in succession, and then we slow down. Here, he manages to convince Jeff to get the camera. Tracy has a moment to grab the knife. He moves towards it, but Jeff returns quickly. Quick cuts in succession, and then we slow down. The entire sequence follows this rhythm throughout. It ebbs and flows as Tracy toes the line, trying to survive, trying to find a way out. We then get our longest shot of the entire sequence, as if it couldn't get any more sick and gruesome in this one minute and nine second shot, Jeff reveals his true twisted intentions. Cause I'm gonna eat it. This long, long take almost serves as a palate cleanser, We've been trapped for so long, for Tracy, it's truly now or never. He goes for it. A struggle breaks out as the two wrestle and Tracy attempts his escape. He gets to the door, but you guessed it, it won't open. A very clever little detail set up earlier in the episode. We watch in horror as Tracy tries to open it. Jeff is back on his feet and approaching Tracy. Another struggle ensues. The handheld camera has now intensified even more, shaking and jittering much more wildly than earlier in the episode. Remember, many watching won't know if Tracy made it out or not. But finally, he manages to shake off Jeff and get out the door, running down the hallway screaming. It is so tense, it's almost hard to breathe. The cutting here is rapid in comparison to what came before. It resembles a fight or flight response, making quick frantic decisions. It's as if you're experiencing that struggle firsthand. And while the scene had been following the pattern I highlighted earlier, this really is the final anxiety-inducing crescendo. 
The average shot length in this final struggle is three seconds. I mean, three seconds compared to one minute, nine seconds. It says it all. And breathe. The relief sets in and the handheld camera goes, but the horror sets in. Help me, please! We return to the locked off shots and the camera that slowly looms and floats eerily, and we become a passive viewer once more, watching as the world slowly realizes what's happened. These are real. Under arrest for attempt to murder. We then switch up and leave Jeff completely. What is it? It's Jeff. Richard Jenkins gives one of the standout performances from the show, alongside Niecy Nash and Evan Peters, of course. All three Emmy-worthy, in my opinion. But it's here where the performances really shine and hit home as to what we've witnessed. It was a very difficult fall. Leonel Dahmer is taken to the police station for questioning, and slowly the information is divulged to him, but also to us. There was a human head in his refrigerator. But only now are we truly given a moment of silence. After being in what felt like a pressure cooker, we're finally given time to reflect on the magnitude of what just happened. And Richard Jenkins delivers the perfect response to all of this information. I heard in an interview with the brilliant Ray Seahorn that the best way to cry as an actor is to try not to cry, to try and hold it in. And watching Lionel here fail to hold it in as his emotions leak and burst out is truly breathtaking. Some neighbors here had complained of a stench for almost a year, but they never imagined. The episode ends where it started, with Glenda in her apartment as she queries. Wait. How many did you find? Setting the viewers up for the rest of the series. We've seen how it all came crashing down, but now we need to find out how this whole thing was even allowed to happen. The whole episode is an introduction to one of the worst serial killers in history. They could have easily shown the viewer gruesome, sore-like scenes or delve deep into the violence. But instead, they used all the tools at their disposal to allow us to feel what it must have been like to be trapped in that apartment. To feel the anxiety, Feel the fear. Help! Help me, and it's some of the most effective television I've seen this year. A masterclass in how to create tension. Thank you for watching. Please do subscribe and share if you enjoyed this. It really helps. I'm a small channel. Uh, but I would love to know what you guys think of the show as a whole in the comments down below. I know some people are divided about whether we should be making these sorts of shows, but I'd love to know where you fall on that argument, and if you leave a comment below, I will probably get back to you, because that's what I spend a lot of my time doing. But yeah, I hope, hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, the channel's kind of, I wouldn't say blown up, it's still very small, but um, a fair few more subscribers. I mean, I was on like 300 for a long time, and now I'm on 2,500. There was a lot of Better Call Saul stuff going on. I was very obsessed with Better Call Saul. I mean, I've got other videos if you're interested in Saul. Go and watch them on my channel. Um, I'm blabbering. But yeah, hope you enjoyed the video, and subscribe, and yeah, goodbye.